Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, introduction to Python. Uh, my name is Chris Myers. I'm a researcher and uh, consultant here in the Cornell Center for Advanced Computing. I'd like to say at the outset that I don't have any, I have no conflicts of interest in, in giving this talk. Uh, so for the purposes of this talk, Python is at least uh, three things. It's, it's first and foremost a programming language. So it defines it defines a syntax and, and has various keywords and data types that are part of the language and rules for how to combine different, different elements. Uh, it is also very importantly a software ecosystem built on top of this programming language. So this consists of both the Python standard library, which comes with any uh, Python installation, as well as many hundreds of thousands, actually, of third-party packages uh, that, that, that are uh, tailored to different tasks. And then thirdly, it's also a program that runs code that is written in the Python language. And so I'm going to talk about all three of the, these things today, although in slightly different order. Uh, I'll start by talking about Python as a program just to help orient you to how to how, how it can be used. And then I'll spend most of the time uh, talking about describing Python as a programming language. Um, I think even if you're ultimately interested in using the broader ecosystem, it's important to know how to how to use the language, how to how to write your own programs to manipulate data uh, and and other objects in various ways, and then at the end I'll I'll sort of I'll conclude by describing some of the elements of this this broader ecosystem, although really as a way to kind of point forward uh, towards towards further talks in this in this series. Um, so to begin with, uh, to, to talk about Python as a program, it's useful to make the distinction between compiled languages and interpreted languages. Uh, compiled languages uh, such as C++, C and C++ and Fortran and Java are processed by a compiler to produce an executable. And then we run that executable, that program, uh, say, in, in some operating system. An interpreted language, on the other hand, of which Python is an example, is processed by another program, another program, which is called an interpreter, that runs and executes program statements. And, and, and these different types of languages have, have different sort of characteristics. Um, there are a number of different Python interpreters, different programs that can run Python code. Uh, the default uh, one is, is known as Python, or more formally known as, as CPython, um, and it might be sometimes installed on your system as Python uh, 3. And this is really sort of the default and reference implementation of the language. Um, and in addition to this, there are other interpreters that have been built on top of this, such as IPython, which uh, is actually a, a package that's written in Python that provides additional functionality for interactive work. And then on top of IPython sits Jupyter, which is a notebook-based software system that, um, that uh, can be used to, to integrate different aspects of, of not just code, but also of, of documentation and graphics, and, and can in fact run with, with other kernels for other languages. Um, and and uh, if you were uh, participating, if you were attending this uh, talk a few weeks ago by my colleague Chris Cameron, you heard a lot about, about Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks and, and the way that we can use those kinds of tools. Um, there are other non C Python based uh, interpreters that are, that are available but are not widely used, and I won't really be covering those here today. Um, so, again, the, each of these interpreters has different strengths and weaknesses and, and, and use cases. Uh, using the bare Python uh, interpreter is useful if you want to say run a long running job in background or in some batch submission system, um, but you can in fact even use it in an interactive case. Uh, if you like to do interactive work, then IPython is 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 more useful. And so, for example, I can start up an IPython console in a terminal, and I can execute some some Python commands. I can assign uh, things to, to to variables. Uh, I can assign object to variables, but then IPython also provides what are known as magic functions. And these all start with, are, are prefaced by a percent sign. And so, for example, I can ask what variables have I defined? Uh, and it shows me that I've defined a couple of uh, integers, X and Y. And this is useful, uh, again, when you're, when you're sort of developing code, when you're interrogating data, you're trying to figure out uh, what kind of uh, algorithms to develop. Um, but these magic functions are not part of the Python language themselves. They're, they're part of this, this, Pyth this IPython extension. Um, and then Jupyter is something, as I said, that sits on top of IPython that provides these web-based environments that merge code and documentation and, and graphics and result. And in fact, this talk that I'm giving is in a live Jupyter notebook. It might not look as such because I'm using an extension that sort of converts these things to slides. But I mean, I can execute 
Python code within these code cells. I can add two integers, or I can concatenate two strings. And this is, uh, you know, this is the way that you can interleave, say, markdown documentation in a notebook with, with code and results. Uh, I'm just going to run this little cell here. This is a nice trick that I learned from Chris's last seminar in Jupyter Lab to facilitate sort of printing things. Um, and just to, uh, just to sort of conclude this this opening section, um, I, you, you know, you might already have. I mean, obviously, you want to if you're if you want to run Python, you need to have it installed somewhere that you have access to. Uh, you might already have a version of Python installed on your machine, but if that's there by default, it's say as part of the operating system. Uh, it's probably being used for system administration tasks, and it's best not to to mess around with that one too much. You can certainly use it to to add additional packages for your own use, but you don't necessarily want to go and try to upgrade that that version. So you probably generally want to install a, a, a another version of Python that you can you can more freely um, cu customize. And and a, a nice uh, set of choices is available from Anaconda. So the Anaconda Python distribution is a big. Uh, installation package that, that installs a large number of Python packages by default. Alternatively, you can install some minimal distribution, say using the Miniconda installer, and then create customized environments for different projects. So if I wanted to create an environment called MyEnv that contained Python and NumPy and Pandas and Jupyter, I could execute a, a Conda command like this using the Miniconda installer. Uh, and, and if I've already perhaps already got Python installed on, on a system somewhere, or it's been installed for me, and I want to create my own custom environments. I can use the the, the Python uh, VN VN module to create a Python virtual environment, and then use pip to install packages uh, to build up a a, 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 a customized uh, installation for myself. Um, so that's just sort of a prelude to sort of how we how we run um, uh, you know how we run. But actually, I, I one thing I I didn't show, which I meant to. Was that um, I had mentioned that Python is this uh, this interpreter that I can also run things in, but interactively, but that it doesn't contain some of these inter extra interactive features. But I can also, you know, run programs on the command line. So if I have a program named spellingb.py, I can run that using the Python interpreter, and that will produce a lot of output. And again, that's useful for for longer running kinds of jobs. Um, but we will return to the spelling bee a bit later. Um, so I'm gonna. Uh, um, so we have a question here. What is the difference between an environment and a virtual environment? Uh, that's a good question. So in Python, um, in the Python virtual, I mean, they are essentially the same thing. They are sort of a, an encapsulated uh, grouping of packages, uh, which may have different versions depending on what you need to be able to run. When you create a Python, when you use the VNV. VENV -E module in Python, you're creating what is called a Python virtual environment. When you do that in Conda, you're creating something analogous, but they just call it a Conda environment. They don't they don't refer to it as a Conda virtual environment. So, um, is it paid or free software? Python is all is all free. You can get a you can get a free distribution from Anaconda. You can also pay for it if you want extra support, but you don't need to. You can always get it for free, and that's one of the one of the great strengths of 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 an appeals of Python. So um, as a programming language, um, I'm going to outline sort of a few elements of that sort of help situate, you know, Python in the space of, of other programming languages you might you might have some experience with. Um, but I want to begin with a little bit of history. Uh, so Python was created by Guido von Rossum in the in the very late 80s and early 1990s. Uh, and he named the, the language after the comedy group Monty Python because he was a big fan. And so a lot of the early documentation actually has references to Monty Python skits and things in those skits. Um, it's interesting to note that the scientific community was an, a very early adopter of Python, not just because of the ability to sort of represent complex kinds of abstractions that arise in, in scientific computing, but also as a, as a mechanism to interface to existing code written in other languages to steer and glue things together. And I'll talk a little bit about, about some of that kind of stuff. Um, Python is is a very popular language, but it's also inspired some some sort of memorable things in the software world. So the notion of you know ensuring project continuity if if a key developer gets hit by a bus was actually started by this 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 thread in the Python news group asking what would happen if Guido was hit by a bus, 
And the notion of a benevolent dictator for life, which is something that many projects have adopted, was initially bestowed upon Guido uh, to acknowledge his role as the final arbiter of, of language decisions. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is that Python is a general purpose language, unlike may, perhaps many of the other things you might encounter in the world of kind of scientific and numerical computing. So, so it's not so unlike so R, for example, is a language that was built to support statistical analysis, and there are statistical functions that are sort of built in as part of the language. Uh, MATLAB was constructed to support linear algebra and matrix operations, and and that and then sort of grew grew a language up around that that basic goal. And Mathematica, for example, was built to support symbolic mathematics. But but Python was not developed that way. It was not developed to support scientific computing or numerical computing. And so much of the useful functionality that's out there for specific application areas is available through third party packages that are part of this big ecosystem. And then this Python language is the substrate for tying all these different pieces together. Um, in my opinion, uh, you know, I, I find Python to be well designed, intuitive, readable, practical, expressive, elegant. It is free, as I mentioned, and it's open source. And, and, and it's because, you know, it, it is a well-designed and intuitive language and a lot of people have gravitated to it, but because it is, it is it extensible to, uh, to support external packages in a very useful way, then it, then it uh, becomes very useful for, for, uh, for other kinds of computing, such as scientific and numerical computing. Um, among other things, Python is an object-oriented language, and what this means is that it provides support for bundling data and functions together into, into complex objects. And it also provides support for defining new types of data for different, for different use cases. And so even though uh, many of the things that people in the world of scientific computing and data science end up working with are arrays and data frames and networks and models and estimators and figures, and these are all classes that are defined by external packages, but that are not part of the core Python language itself. Um, but it, Python is, is not particularly strict about this object orientation and provides a lot of support for, for doing things rather simply in procedural and functional programming context as well. So it's important to understand that everything in Python is an object. It has a, a type, a value. Uh, it will ha typically have some attributes, which are data that are defined in associating with these objects, some, some methods, which are functions attached to objects. And then there's a namespace that organizes those attributes and methods. And so, for example, when I execute the command two plus two, what I'm really doing is I'm calling an add method that's defined on the integers, of which two is an example. And so this plus operator is overloaded to result end up resulting in a call to this integer add method. Similarly, when I concatenate two strings using the plus operator to produce some concatenated string, then this is this plus operator is calling a, a, an add method on a, on a string class. And this dot operator uh, is, is something that allows us to access elements in an object's uh, namespace. So there's a built-in function dir that, for example, returns a list of all the names in a namespace. So I can ask what is in the namespace of two. And we see that there are lots of these kind of uh, kind of hidden functions such as add and, and there's a, there'd be a, sub, a subtract, a sub in here somewhere and, and so on and so forth. These are various operations that I can do on, on objects of uh, of type integer that, but I can do, I can execute a similar kind of command to look at the namespace of, of any object in Python. Uh, Python is a dynamically typed language, which means we don't, we, that variables acquire the type of whatever is assigned to them. So if I say, if I say x equals three, x might, and I would, x wouldn't necessarily have even been defined previous to this, then x acquires a value three in the type integer or int. If I then in the next line say x equals 3.14, then x now becomes a, a floating point number uh, with that value. And then I can I can overwrite that again and say x is hello world, and now x becomes a string. And so I don't, this is as compared to statically typed languages where I would I would need to pre-declare what type x was. And then if I if I assign to it um, some value that was inconsistent with that, I would I would typically get some sort of error reported. Um, this type of dynamic typing, uh, where, where variables acquire the type of whatever is assigned to them, is often used in interpreted languages. And static typing is often used in compiled languages, but I don't think that's that's strictly, you know, that that's strictly the case. I mean that there are there are different um, examples of, of, of mixing of that. 
Uh, Python, as I said, is an interpreted language, and so it's processed by an interpreter. And this default C Python interpreter actually does some bit of on-the-fly compilation when it when it parses Python source code. It creates intermediate bytecodes that then get executed by an interpreter, but you don't actually ever see any of that. That just happens under the covers. Uh, each statement is executed sequentially, and so this is then very useful for interactive analysis, for inter for development, for prototyping. Um, but but then can be scaled up to run you know longer running jobs. Uh, interpreted uh, programs written in interpreted languages are typically slower than for compiled languages because there is this process of 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 of, of source code interpretation that goes on. And so what this sort of reflects is that you're sort of trading off development time versus execution time. That it, you can often develop a program much more quickly in a in a, in a language like Python than say in in some compiled language like C++, but then when you run it, it, it might be slower. And so where how that trade-off applies to your particular application and UK use case, you need to you need to sort of try to try to navigate. Uh, one way of working around that is is by recognizing that Python is an extensible language. And what that means is that the Python language, the standard, also defines a an API, an application programming interface that allows Python to talk to, to code written in C and therefore essentially any other any other language. Um, and this C Python API enables the, the, the Python interpreter to process compiled code that's written in C, but make it look like it's uh it it's it's accessible and in fact to make it accessible in Python. So in fact, many programs that are written in the Python language are actually calling compile functions written in some other language, which ends up resulting in higher computational performance than if you were sort of running pure Python code alone. And in fact, there are many tools that exist that have been developed for generating interfaces to compile code, for compiling different bits of Python code that are that are kind of time, time sensitive uh, to what are called extension modules. And we have a, in our Cornell virtual workshop at the, in, the, in the CAC, we have a, a topic on Python for high performance that I encourage you to look at if you're interested in this. That describes in much more detail what this what this process of, of creating compiled extension modules and using and using some of those techniques for for better numerical performance when when long you know run times are are expected. Um, there are a number of built-in data types in Python, as as is typical for pretty much any programming language. There are certain numeric types, um, you know, integers and floats and complex numbers and 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 Boolean types. There are string data types. There are a number of built-in container data types that I'll talk a bit more about that are make it very useful for building up uh, complicated programs very very quickly. Um, functions, every as I said, everything in, in Python is an object. So functions are objects and classes are objects and modules that you import to access different kinds of functionality. Those are all objects and those are all built-in types uh, in, in the Python language. I mentioned these container data types, and and there are various uh, uh, these built-in types that are that are very useful for a number of things. So we can create lists, which are which are ordered sequences of objects. Uh, in Python, we start counting indices at zero rather than at one, and say in some other languages. But then we can access we can we can walk through that list, or we can access any element by its integer position. Uh, dictionaries are also incredibly useful. These are mappings from a set of keys to a set of associated values. So this goes by other names in, in other kinds of programming languages. Um, but this is very useful when you want to when you want to relate, you know, uh, different types of data to each other. Uh, sets are another built in type. So these are these are unordered collections and of unique elements. But what's very useful is that they support set algebra so we can we can compute unions of sets and intersections and differences and this is incredibly useful for for a, a large number of different kinds of operations um, there are tuples that allow us to bundle together related items and then strings which are ordered sequences of characters and that are and that support many particular in particular kind of string processing operations so even though these are sort of the core of the built-in container types in python a number of other uh, packages, these third-party packages, build other kinds of containers. So, for example, in NumPy, we we are introduced to arrays. These are potentially multi-dimensional arrays, and in some ways, they share a lot of characteristics with lists. 
but they they extend that concept to, to to multiple dimensions that are very useful for numerical computing. And then if we're working with tabular data, we we might end up uh, working with data frames and and series, which again are are containers that hold collections of items. And these are defined, for example, in in the pandas package. Um, and we'll see we'll see a bit more about those later. Um, Often when, when people are first getting started with Python, they're, they're, and even the sort of the main Python tutorial has you work with Python as a calculator. And, and I, I would say this is incredibly useful. I mean, I sort of use Python and in particular IPython as a calculator pretty much all, uh, on a daily basis for various tasks. But you know, we've got the, the standard kinds of um, you know, arithmetic operations. Um, and, and so for example, we can combine uh, these things to to compute various kinds of numerical expressions, or we can we can assign variables to data, or you know data to variables, and then write mathematical expressions that make use of those uh, those variables. And and uh, again, it's it's you can do this just within an IPython or Jupyter console, and it's very useful um, more so than trying to to type numbers into some calculator app or something. Um, one of the one of the the design goals that that uh, that Guido von Rossum uh, wanted to institute into Python was was its readability, and 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 uh, and one of the important ways that that gets accomplished is by using indentation to identify code blocks, and this is rather different than than most other languages, um, and it's and and therefore it's useful to if you're writing code in Python to to use a code editor that understands this. It understands Python, so it can you know carry out help you with that indentation. But for example, if if in Python we want to loop, we want to write a for loop to loop over the integers from zero to nine, we would write a for statement like this, and then we would indent underneath that, and everything that's indented at a, at that level below that for loop becomes part of the for loop. It, it, that all that gets executed through the for loop. Whereas in a language like C or C plus plus, we would define that code block that's associated with a for loop by opening and closing curly braces. So we would need these additional characters to define the code block, whereas Python just uses the indentation itself. Um, and that once we de-indent back out to the level where this for is, then we're no longer in that, in that for loop. Um, similarly, we, if we want to have if else kinds of statements, we, we, we indent uh, to define code blocks in, the, in this kind of branching. Whereas other languages, say such as MATLAB, would often introduce other keywords, such as the end keyword, that would tell us when we were done with that. So, so, so part of the design goal here is to use use the indentation to define uh, the, the the code blocks rather than other keywords that delineate delineate that structure. And and sometimes that's for people who are getting started. That's takes a little getting used to, but it, but but you sort of get the hang of it eventually. Uh, Python provides support for all typical kinds of control flow. I should I mentioned for loops. You know we can there are for loops and while loops, and we can break through from those in various ways, uh, branching with if elif else constructs, uh, and it, as well as exception handling, which I'll, I'll show a little bit about. Um, so we often in in sort of scientific computing we want we have we might have some collection of data and we want to iterate over it and do something to that and so again this for loop allows us to iterate over some some thing some kind of container and and essentially it can iterate over anything that is iterable and that's a that's a pretty open ended definition to some extent in in python i mean i can so i can iterate over a list the list that contains the items a b c d e but i can also iterate over this uh, for i in range ten, printing out these these integers going from from zero to nine, and and it, if you go and you look, you say, well, what is what is range ten? What is that? What is that? It's actually it just it it represents itself as this object. So we can, for example, query the help system to see what range does, and what range does is it is as it returns an object that produces a sequence of integers from start to to stop perhaps by some some step. Um, so it doesn't range does not produce a sequence of integers. It produces an object that can be iterated over to produce a sequence of integers. And so this is an example of what's known as lazy evaluation, which introduces various efficiencies that and instead of producing 
the, the list 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's just capable of returning each of those things as it's iterated over. And as we see in the documentation, we can we can go from a start to a stop with a step. And so we can we could do we could go to four from four to 17 and steps of three. Um, if we wanted to be able to create this list, we could we could, for example, call the list function on it and produce the list. But if all we want to do is iterate over those integers, we don't actually need to produce this list. And, and there are many aspects of many elements of Python that have a similar kind of feel um, that, that, uh, that they don't, you know, if you just need to iterate over something, you can, you can do that more efficiently through this type technique of lazy evaluation. Uh, there's a question here saying, asking if I'm using IPython right now. I'm actually using a, this is a Jupyter notebook that I'm running in, um, which, and Jupyter by in, when run with Python code uses the IPython kernel. So all of those kind of magic functions that I was mentioning at the beginning in, in IPython are available within Jupyter as well. Um, so, so in that sense, yes, I am using IPython and I am using Jupyter. Um, so even though range 10 doesn't explicitly produce, I mean, it doesn't produce this list because it can be iterated over, I can, I can, and I can apply any function to it that, that, that can interpret an iterable. So for example, I can sum this list of integers just by summing, by iterating through this set of things that are produced by that, uh, rather than by creating the, the, the list itself. And if this is a very long list, this can actually result in significant both time and, and memory savings to, to sort of just produce elements as I need them rather than sort of pre-produce them um, uh, uh, in advance. Um, I can iterate over other, other iterables. So a dictionary, as I said, is something that maps keys to values. So in this case, I have a dictionary that maps the keys A, B, and C to the numbers one, two, and three, respectively. And dictionaries provide a method called items. And so I can iterate over the, the list of key value pairs and for example, just print them out. And so even though a dictionary is not a, uh, there's, there's not necessarily a sense of order in a dictionary, I can, I, can, I can iterate through it and all iterating does is guarantee that I visit every element in the, in the collection uh, once. Uh, there are some, some constructs that have been imported from functional programming languages that, that make things even more compact. I mean, so this notion of comprehensions, list comprehensions and dictionary comprehensions, so, for example, I can embed this kind of for loop in a in a statement that produces a list where the list contains the squares. So I'm looping over n from zero to nine, but then I'm producing a list that contains n times n, the squares of n, and and I can essentially do that in one line without having to write out a loop and 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 put elements in a list. And this can be this can be uh, once you understand what the syntax looks like, it's, a, it's, it's both more readable and more, and more compact. And similarly, a dictionary comprehension lets me create a dictionary on the fly. So if I want to create a mapping of all of the ASCII letters in this, in this string module, I can, I can do so with a, with a line like this. And then this produces this big this dictionary that, that maps letters to their positions in, in this list. Um, and we'll see a little bit more of, of ways of using those kinds of tools. Uh, I mentioned exception handling, and this is something that, that not all languages provide the same degree of support for, um, but, it, but it can be very useful. So I have some commented code here, but if I uncomment this uh, and try running it, I'm going to calculate, I'm going to loop over denominators and then use those to divide uh, one by the denominator. And when I get to the end here, I see that I'm trying to divide one by zero, and that gives me a zero division error. And so if, if, if you had code like this in a program and you ended up sort of dividing by zero, your program would just stop right there and throw this error. But what you can do instead is, is, is try a, a particular action such as dividing by the denominator and then catching an exception. So if we do this now, um, we see that the, it, 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 the things that it can divide by it does, but then when it actually encounters this zero division error. We can catch this with an accept statement, and we can deal with that in some other way. We obviously can't divide by zero, but we could decide how we do want to deal with that, maybe by printing something out or assigning it to some other value or what, or what have you. So again, this is a this is sort of a Pythonic. Um, given that there's nice support for this, uh, part of the Pythonic uh, design sense is that you 
rather than checking ahead of time to see whether you can do something, you can try it and then and then respond to any any errors that might arise. Similarly, if we want to uh, open a file, try to open a file that doesn't exist, we can we can catch a file not found error and 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 deal with that more more gracefully. So that's all part of the you know the kind of control flow uh, things that are that are part of the core language. Um, another obviously very important thing in 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 any programming language is the ability to define functions, and the def keyword is what is used to do this. So by saying def concatenate, we're going to define a function name concatenate, and this thing takes takes three arguments. And then within the code block, which is indented here, uh, we, we potentially could do a bunch of things. In this case, the only statement we have is that we're going to return a value. So this is going to add string one plus separator plus string two. It's going to concatenate two strings with some separator. And in fact, we can define a default value for the separator. So we can define default arguments. So if I don't provide a, uh, a, a separator explicitly, this default value gets used, which is just a space. But if I want to, I can override that and provide a third argument explicitly. So I can define a different separator, which in which case then I get, for example, these double dots. Um, so I can override a default argument um, by, by providing it. And if I'm willing to type some extra stuff, I can actually provide these arguments in any in any order by what in, using what are called keyword arguments. So I can I can explicitly say what the separator is, what string two is, what string one is, and then, and this, and again, these keyword arguments uh, get, get can get processed out of order as to how they're defined. And these are very useful for when you've got a, you're calling a function that has lots and lots of arguments, lots and lots of of of, of inputs, most of which have default values, but maybe you want to override one or two of them. And so, rather than having to type in the whole suite of of things, you can just uh, provide keyword arguments to set to set a few of those within within the function call, and that can be extremely useful. Um, so we can put all these pieces together. I've given you just sort of a sketch of some of the elements of this, and I want to give you a sense as to how how easily it is to sort of use some of these pieces to sort of do something a little non-trivial. So I don't know how many of you play the spelling bee game on the New York Times website. Um, maybe you could raise your hands in the in the in the in the in the Zoom session there, if you do, but um, in any case, what what spelling bee does is you know it 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 asks you to to construct words built out of the series of letters, um, and and all the words have to at least contain have to contain the center letter. So in this case, all the words have to have the letter B, and I want to find as, as many words of four or more letters uh, that that contain that can that contain that center one, and I can reuse as many letters as I want. Um, and sometimes when you're playing this game, you you find yourself Sort of iterating over, you know, you might know you need a five letter word that starts with BL and then you just start trying all possible combinations because maybe it's a word you don't know. At least that's the way I play. Uh, I, I start trying to do this kind of iterating around the around the, the circle to, to, to try different combinations of letters. Um, but we can actually write a little program that does that. Um, does that for me. And in fact, I've written this because, uh, you know, I, I use this sometimes when I'm playing spelling bee. Um, I don't consider this cheating because it's not a, it's it's actually just generating all possible words consistent with the letters. It's not actually telling me whether any of them are words. So I still have to figure out whether any of them are words. But um, this is a little this this little program here um, does this. And I just wanted to kind of walk through this as an example of how to use some of these different aspects of of this of this language. Um, so the first thing I'm doing is actually I'm I'm stepping out of the core language and then I'm importing a, a, another module. So iter tools is part is a module that's part of the um, the Python standard library. And so it's not part of the built-in language, but I can import it and then access things that that are defined within that module. And this is very useful because it it's actually going to figure out all the combinatorics of how to mix and match all the different letters and different combinations that that and it can do that more systematically and more quickly than I can. Um, I can assign some variables to store data. So I can, for example, store the set of letters that are part of uh, the current day spelling bee, and I can define the center letter by convention as the as the, the first element indexed at position zero. So it's the letter B. And then I can say I want to start, find letter words that start with BL and that have five letters total. And then sometimes I might say, oh, I, I don't really think this, this, you know, there's gonna be a word that has two I's in a row or two U's in a row or 
or three, you know, combinations of three. So I can I can define a set. I can use the built-in Python object uh, type set to to define a set of of character patterns, string patterns that I want to exclude from from consideration. And I can define a function that takes the set of available letters, takes the starting letters that I that I, I want, I'm trying to build words from, and the the total length. And then essentially what this function does is it uses um, the product. So, oh, I mean, that messes things up there. Within the, um, the iter tools module, there's a function called product that's basically gonna generate all the combinations of possible letters. Um, and, and, and you just need to look up the documentation on, on the iter tools module to see that this is the function you need. And then it uses list comprehensions to, to produce all of the, all of the, the words that are built from the set of available letters start with a specified set of letters and then and then are of a given length. And, and again, this is pretty compact stuff, but once you write and debug this function, you can call it to generate all possible words. And then at the end here, I have a little loop where I loop over all the words that I've just created by calling this function. And I check to see whether or not the word complain contains one of the ex excluded substrings that I that I don't want to. I don't want to allow, um, and so it does some little some checking there with some a for loop and an if statement, and then finally at the end, if 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 it doesn't include one of these excluded pieces and the center letter is part of the word, then I print it out, and so um, I can, for example, here's the code as actual Python, not as marked up um, stuff there, and I can run it and and it then produces starting from BL all the five letter words that don't include. Um, you know, and there's a few hundred of these. And again, so this is not, this is something, this is a list that I need to, to go through and try to figure out whether there's uh, something, something in there that might be a real, real word. But, uh, but this, this, I hope gives you a sense of how with just a few of the, the sort of the constructs that the, that the language defines, you can sort of build up things that do some non-trivial kinds of computations pretty quickly. And I can use, for example, this who's thing that I was, that I mentioned before, and now I can see this is now listing everything in this whole session that I've done so far, but this includes, for example, you know, the iter tools module and, and iter tools is actually a type of type module. Um, I defined a function um, called, where did my function go? I defined a function called words. And so that is a type function. It's a, it's a function that lives at this, this place in memory. Uh, everything that I've created here is an object. It has it's you know it's got a it's got a type and then there's various pieces of information that are that are reported here uh, as part of this this interactive magic function called who's um, so that um, that's sort of the end of what I was going to present about about the the language as opposed to the the bigger ecosystem so if there are questions about any I I realize I went through a bunch of stuff there. Um, but if there are questions about any of that, we could we could entertain those now, or we could we could revisit them at the end, um, just because this is sort of a, a sort of a useful breakpoint. Um, but if not, then I will um, I will I will continue on. And um, so again, I I I I I was I was I, some people you know are are drawn to using Python because they hear that it. Um, can I repeat what the center function does? So center was not a function. Center was actually just a variable. Um, so so the word so so in the in the in the spelling bee there is a special letter which is the one that's at the center of the of the honeycomb here. In this case, it's B, and 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 it's it's special because all the words that we that we define have to at least contain one instance of that letter. And so all I'm doing here is I'm saying the available letters are B, E, I, L, N, T, and U, but the center one is the one that's in the first position, which is indexed by zero. So, so I'm just using that because I need to, I know that I need to check later whether or not the word uh, that I generate contains this. And so it's not a, it's not a function. It's just a, in this case, it is just equal to the letter, the letter B. And in fact, if we go to the who's, we in fact see that, right? We say that center, is a is is a data type of type string and its value is b and 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 so again this you know this kind of thing is can be very useful if you're not sure what type something is you know maybe you're you're running some code and you want to 
and you don't quite understand what's being created, you can you can use a function like this to to try to to try to make sense of that. Thank you for the question. Um, right. So this this Python language provides you know a, a substrate for 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 using programming constructs to define functions to define classes. I didn't talk about that, although I alluded to it to define various kinds of control flows, which I gave you a little sense of. Um, and it also gives us this, this substrate for importing and using functions that are defined in external packages, such as this iter tools module that I that I imported. Um, and that this, so this ecosystem actually is, is much larger than just what's in this, this Python standard library, even though there, there's often a, a very useful uh, set of tools there that you can you know, build upon. Um, um, uh, but, uh, and I'll answer this question in just a moment, I just want to sort of finish this thought, but actually this, this Python, um, when I talk about Python as an ecosystem, it's really a, a set of multiple kind of overlapping ecosystems that, that the Python standard library provides a lot of useful tools for interacting with the operating system. So in fact, it ends up being used a lot in operating systems to, to build various system administration tasks. Um, that are more easily done, say, than with something like a, a you know, a, 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 a shell scripting environment. Um, it's a set of tools for, it's widely used as a set of tools for web programming and website development, or for generation of graphical user interfaces. And then finally, what I'm going to kind of focus on here is that it's, it's an environment for scientific computing and data science and machine learning that's, that's very rich and has grown over, over several decades uh, to provide a, a lot of functionality. So there's a question here, what would be the best way to independently learn Python? Are the resources you would recommend to learn more in addition to the Python series through Cornell? So certainly in our, I mentioned our um, our CVW, our Cornell Virtual Workshop, cvw.cornell.edu. Is that the right? No, it's cvw.cac.cornell.edu. That's the right one, I think. Um, and let me send that to everybody here. Um, I'm sorry. That was okay. So that was a that was a that was not a that was not a that was a question to me specifically. Um, so certainly you could start with our CVW series. You could, uh, um, if you're if you're interested in in sort of more. Um, uh, well, I mean that that would be a place. Certainly there are lots of good resources online. Uh, depending on what your interests are, I'd be happy to. To try to suggest further, but you could start with our CVW and then, and then um, sort of decide where to branch out from there based on what you see. So in this ecosystem, I'm going to focus again on this last element, this environment for um, scientific computing, data science, and machine learning. And this is something that has again has been developed by many people over many years. Um, it starts with the Python interpreter and with this, this C Python API that I mentioned, but then it also includes uh, the Python standard library, which I alluded to, as well as really sort of the, the, the centerpiece of oh, a lot of this is, is what's known as NumPy, numerical Python. And from by building up these layers, this ecosystem provides a lot of support for scientific computing and, and data analysis through various packages. Uh, for data visualization through through a different set of packages, and for machine learning, which again sort of combine uh, different aspects of of these different subsystems in order to enable uh, a lot of a lot of rich work um, without requiring people to build up the sort of core algorithms from scratch. And so, um, so even though you might be interested in using elements of this ecosystem. I do feel it is important, you know, and it's really not sufficient just to to think that you can sort of make function calls um, to 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 functions in these packages without understanding some of the aspects of the programming language, which is why I was sort of emphasizing that as a first step. But in what we'll continue, I just want to talk a little bit about what this ecosystem kind of looks like and what's 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 possible. So NumPy or numerical Python introduces this key new data type that's not part of the core language. Uh, that are multi-dimensional arrays or or ND arrays, so these can live in any any of n dimensions, um, and and so they provide both new data types, arrays, as well as a syntax, an array syntax that enables compact expressions and efficient computations with these arrays. It also provides functionality for linear algebra and random numbers, and serves as a substrate 
for array-based computations throughout that whole ecosystem that I was just describing on the previous slide. So it's similar in spirit to the role that arrays and matrices play in MATLAB. And in fact, there's some documentation online that if you're, a, for example, a MATLAB user who wants to maybe try using NumPy instead, there's sort of a useful uh, translation table, if you will, um, that, 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 that can help you do that kind of migration. Um, so an array, uh, again, can exist in multiple dimensions, say, as, say two dimensions as is sketched here on the left, or maybe in three dimensions. These are defined by axes, uh, uh, essentially the, the different the different dimensions. So there'd be three axes in a three-dimensional array, two in a two-dimensional array. And, and all of these arrays are homogeneous in type, meaning that I can't mix and match different types within an array, unlike say in a Python list. So in this one that I've shown on the left, this is a this is a 2D array of type with, with type uh, integer, but I can have floating point arrays or complex arrays or Boolean arrays or, or whatever. Um, and then and then once I, I, I understand this basically basic anatomy of an array, I can use it to build up um, various kinds of operations. So for example, I can construct an array. I would first have to import NumPy. Um, and this is sort of a variant of this import statement that if I don't want to have to type NumPy every time, and this is kind of a convention within the community, I import NumPy as NP. So I'm importing the NumPy module, but I'm sort of renaming it on the fly as NP. And when I and this now allows me to define, say, an array explicitly from a set of nested lists, such as uh, this this array X that's shown down below here, this 2D array, or I can use the random module within NumPy to create a random three by three matrix, such as as this thing shown here. Um, and then this array syntax lets me create expressions on arrays that rather that sort of operate across the entire array without requiring me to sort of loop over those arrays explicitly. So for example, if I want to multiply element every element of, of x by 3 and every element of y by 4 and then add those two together, I can do that with a statement like this. Of course, this only makes sense if x and y have the same shape, but um, given that they do, it, it can carry out this computation and then and then produce this result here. Um, there are also a number of methods that are defined on these arrays. So, for example, if I want to sum up uh, a, 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 all the row elements to get a sum for each column of this X array, I can I can execute a statement like this using the sum method on the array and specifying which axis I want to sum over. So, again, I can very quickly um, sort of build up um, you know kinds of more elaborate expressions without having to sort of explicitly loop over these things to, 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 to modify elements. Um, SciPy or scientific Python is a very large package that is essentially a set of Python wrappers around lots of well-established code written in C and C++ and Fortran and other languages that have been developed over many years that, that provide different kinds of, of, of you know, numerical methods, uh, which I'm sort of listing here and that are sort of broken off into submodules. So for example, if you want to integrate a set of differential equations, you would, you would import something from the scipy.integrate um, module. And, and so again, if you want to do any of these things, rather than you trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to, how to do it yourself, you basically can, can, can figure out which, which functions you need to import from, from SciPy um, and, and, then, and then write the, the, the appropriate code to sort of customize what it is that, that you need to do specifically. Uh, Pandas is very useful for working with, um, with tabular data. So for example, as I might, I might find in a spreadsheet like, like here, where now, unlike a, an, an array, each of these columns might have a different data type, a different D type. So I might I might be combining date time objects and string objects and 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 floating point data, and and again this is typical for what you'd see in say a CSV file or an Excel file or maybe something that you retrieve from a SQL database, and pandas lets us define new data types, um, uh, or it defines a new data new data type such as data frames and series, and then I can I can use those to to say read uh, you know read data from, from files or from databases. Uh, you know, I can add new columns to this thing based on uh, deriving uh, from existing columns. There's a very powerful group by functionality. So I could group, I could group over subsets of data. I could, for example, group by each of the observers and figure out what the, what the mean data values 
observed by each of the each of the observers. And there's lots more functionality. So if you've got data that's sitting in an, in an Excel file or a, in a CSV file, and you want to do something more than what Excel can do, or that you don't know how to do in Excel, and you want to write up a, a program in Python to do it, you can use pandas to import that data to clean it up, um, and so on and so forth. And and in fact, we we have um, in our CVW, right? It is in fact cvw.cac.cornell.edu, as I was saying. Um, we've got a couple of, of, of tutorials on in two parts on, on sort of using pandas and NumPy and, and other and other uh, packages for, for, for data science. Um, and I would encourage you, this would be another place where, where you could go to sort of see not, you know, sort of it's not so much about the language itself, but then how to use the Python language in, in conjunction with these packages to carry out various kinds of kinds of operations. Um, Python for data visualization is also kind of a rich area. Um, there are many different packages that do various things. Kind of the, 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 the core, as I say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, that's the markdown code, if you're curious, that produces this marked up version of the text. Um, matplotlib is, is, is really the cornerstone and workhorse of this Python data visualization universe, especially if you're your focus, you know, often as you know, in our work as in science, we're focused on generating figures and images that are going to go into papers or presentations or reports, static figures that we want to tweak in various ways. And Matplotlib gives a lot of a lot of fine grain control for that kind of uh, that kind of um, functionality. Um, but then there are other packages that basically use Matplotlib to customize that data visualization in various ways. So pandas, which I just mentioned. Um, uses matplotlib, under, matplotlib underneath for visualizing data from data frames, but then provides additional other functionality. Seaborn is a nice package if you're working a lot with statistical distributions and trying to understand multivariate relationships. It, it's, it adds new higher level functionality on top of matplotlib, but, um, but still lets you customize, use matplotlib to customize whatever aspects of those data visualizations you're interested in. And stats models is a package, for example, that, that has a lot of support for statistical modeling, but then uses Matplotlib to, to present results of, 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 of those, those analyses. Um, Plot9 is a, is a Python implementation of the grammar of graphics. And, and, I, and my colleague, Chris Cameron, talked a little bit about this in his, in, in his previous talk on, on, on JupyterLab. Um, there are a number of packages that are available to generate interactive data visualizations. And this is very useful when you want to be able to explore data, not just present some static image for, for a paper, but you actually want to use in, you know, human interaction as part of the, the data exploration process. And I'll show a little bit of, of, what, of what that looks like. Um, and then if you're, if you're explicitly working with three-dimensional data, maybe uh, MRI scans of, of, a, of tissue or, or uh, a solid mechanics model, you know, defined in, in a finite element calculation or something like that. Then there are other packages that have Python interfaces that can be very useful for, for visualizing those kinds of 3D objects in, in three dimensions. Um, so if I want to plot something with Matplotlib, it's pretty simple. I can, I'm just going to get a, a, a sample data set here. So this is a data frame that is used in a number of different kind of data science examples. It's each row is a is a make and model of car in a particular year, and then there's various uh, attributes um, associated with with that car model. And if I want to plot, for example, the relationship between um, between the, the the weight of the car and the miles per gallon, I can, for example, use the in Matplotlib this the scatter function, which lets me create a scatter plot from from the from those columns of that of that data frame. And so this, and again, I can then use other aspects of, of the, the Matplotlib uh, API to, to customize aspects of that, of that, of that kind of visualization. Um, in Bokeh, I need to write a little bit more code, but when I do so, I can in fact um, generate a, a plot that has some degree of interactivity to it. So for example, now I can hover over data points in this data set and I can, and, and I can see all of the, the, the data, even though I'm just plotting two columns against each other, I can in fact hover over and see the data from all the other columns. And that's by 
sort of using some of the functionality that Bokeh provides to allow me to um, say what, what kinds of data I wanna hover over. So I wouldn't necessarily wanna stick this, this thing in, in my paper, but, but for in, investigating data and trying to figure out the best kinds of analyses to do, this can be, this can be very useful. Um, I'll just say very quickly, Python is used for a lot of different kinds of machine learning and deep learning applications. Scikit-learn is a very comprehensive package that's got lots of different algorithms and lots of different documentation for, for doing different kinds of you know, uh, machine learning tasks, such as classification and regression and clustering and, and so on and so forth, and provides a rich set of objects that, that implement all of this. Um, and then there's also a number of Python packages that support a particular type of machine learning known as deep learning, which involves the construction of neural networks that then are able to, to learn from data. So TensorFlow and Keras and PyTorch and Cafe are examples of this, which are again are, are have Python have a Python interface, even though a lot of the numerical computation is being carried out in a compiled language like C underneath. Um, and so these are widely used for a broad array of tasks, such as image, image classification, and speech recognition, and other other kinds of things. Um, and one of the cool things about these packages is that they present things that are like NumPy arrays, but they in fact extend that functionality because one of the important things you need to do in learning uh, parameters in a neural network from data is to be able to compute gradients with respect to parameters and do what's called backpropagation to, to train those neural networks. And so under, lying under all these, these Python interfaces are, are, are objects that support what, what's, what's known as automatic differentiation which is a, a computational technique that allows us to compute derivatives of, of results at the same time as computing those results. And, and so there's a lot of interest, if you're interested in that, in sort of the innards of what this, these kinds of systems look like, there's a lot you could learn about. Um, finally, I'll just mention very briefly that, that you know, there, I talked about being able, trying to accelerate Python code, for example, by generating these compiled extension modules if we want to accelerate Python code more broadly, we can do so by making more of it running in, a, in this compiled C Python API. We can learn about techniques for writing faster pure Python, or we can, for example, introduce um, uh, parallel processing, running sort of multiple copies of Python at the same time. And all of these are useful strategies if, if ultimately what we're trying to do is, is reduce our runtime, the runtime of some application, we can, we can mix and match these different techniques. There's a question there about multi-threading. Multi-threading is complicated in Python because the C Python interpreter has what's known as a global interpreter lock or a GIL uh, as, it's, as it's called. And so it, it, it's, it's hard to do straight up multi-threading the way that you might do in some other systems, but there are, you can multi-thread within these extension modules, for example, or you can run multiple processes, but not, not as not as process with multiple threads as you as again as you might do in 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 other systems but there some of that's being is being worked on it to try to improve it but it but it um it is it is a you know if you just try to naively do multi-threading the way you might do in some other language it it doesn't scale the way you think it should because because of this global interpreter lock that that only locks a single thread um operational at a time um, I, I, I'm, I've reached the end of the hour, so I won't go through, I won't go through this little example, but it's a sort of a fun example showing the kinds of speed up that we can do um, by using this array syntax rather than explicitly looping over arrays, but that's something we could look at in, in more in further detail. Um, so I, I, I've presented to you this introduction to Python, and I've presented this overview of possible future topics as part of this last section, because these are this is sort of how as I was imagining this introduction of the language into the system would be good to help help uh, those of you decide, you know, who might want to be using Python, whether you want to invest the effort to learn more about Python for scientific computing, Python for data visualization, Python machine for machine learning and accelerating Python code. And so these are potentially topics that will reappear in more detail more depth in, in subsequent lectures in this series. So I hope I've given you some senses to sort of how Python serves as both an expressive programming language that allows us to sort of create our, our own custom analyses and workflows, as well as a rich set of packages that we can, we can access using the Python language, um, again, to, 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 to build up um, you know, the kinds of 
complex computations that we need to, to get our work done. So with that, I'd be happy to take any, any more questions. <laughs>